Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Um, when we were in the green room just now, before uh, Katie, our executive producer, cut Kevin Pace, cut you and I off. Yes, we are live on X, formerly known as Twitter. We are live on um, LinkedIn and then also YouTube Live. Of course, you can find the Nonprofit Show many places. We're on Actually, now we're up to 22 different platforms, wow. but uh, I wanted to make sure that I drew that through. But more importantly, Katie Warnick, one of my favorite bon vivant women and people of all times. Whew. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks. <laughs> this is going to be an important, important show because you're going to give us the down and dirty on how to vet potential staff. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot about like what you all do at Staffing Boutique, but mm -hmm. what the general parameters are for the industry. And so I'm really interested in learning more because some of this seems to be controversial and I don't know, man, it's like a new day. And I want to get the insights from the woman in charge. Sure. Keep, it, keep in mind, I'm, I work in staffing. I'm not HR, right? So correct. <laughs> yeah. So my and, and, opinion views are maybe a little, not always what you, are the correct views. Well, and I love that you said that because that's why I want your voice on this. Sure. You know, I think that you are, you're living like, what's the reality of these outcomes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that's, what's really interesting to get this perspective because to, to me, I feel like it's a truer perspective as to how it's going to actually impact our sector. 100%, so, yeah. Yeah. Really amazing. Well, another hundred percent is the sponsorship that we have and the partnership, I should say, with these amazing companies. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episodes, and your part-time controller we have these amazing, amazing co-hosts. I'm Julia C. Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, flying solo today with my friend Katie Warnick. Um, and so, Katie, let's dig into this. Talk about Staffing Boutique and what it is that you all do, because I think this is riveting and you're such a unique sure. uh, part of the sector. Yeah, so I am the founder of Staffing Boutique. We are a full service recruitment agency specifically for the nonprofit sector. So we do temp, temp to perm and permanent recruitment on a contingency basis. So we are serving nonprofits and charter schools in the New York, New York City area mostly. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. It's an amazing thing because you've spent a lifetime in in labor and staffing and all of these things, right? I mean, this is this is really a trajectory that's followed you since you graduated from college, right? Yeah, it's 20 years. I can't believe it. I've been doing recruitment for nonprofits and I had no idea what philanthropy was when I entered this world. And so 20 years of basically eating, breathing and sleeping fundraisers and <laughs> teachers is how I live. It's how I make a living. I think it's fabulous. Well, you know, we're really proud of you because I have to de declare she was educated in my home state at ASU. So that's why I'm like, well, that's why she's so successful. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying it. I'm just saying, it. well, let's get into it. And, and we have so much to cover, but I want to ask you the first thing when we're vetting potential candidates, these letters of reference recommendation, what do they mean and, and how powerful are they? I have views on this. So I, I don't think that they hold a lot of weight. Um, okay. I, I personally don't read them. I know that sometimes um, my clients will ask for them. I have seen them be useful if someone is downsized and they, you know, they want to be kept, but their boss was like, we have to cut somewhere. We're so sorry to see you go. Like, so that's, that that works. You know, that's that's a nice little bonus to a full job process. Um, but when someone is just sort of putting forward a letter of reference without asking for one, it's a little suspect, I think, um, because you're obviously going to 
give a letter of reference from someone you know that is going to give you a good reference, right? It's basically the same thing as reference checks. Like no one is going to give you a phone number or an email for you to do a reference of someone that's going to give you a bad reference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is a nice add-on, but, but I don't think that they're necessary. Is there a level of prestige that gets associated with who's that, that title or that name on the letter? And if you, if you have somebody prestigious, even though they might have written just a very short snippet, does that have some cachet? Is that a value or just? I believe so. Yeah. If it's coming from the CEO or the executive director, you know, I think that that always holds a little bit more weight than just the HR person, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. just sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> HR. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing because you know, you look at these things and, and you're like, to your point, who's going to write something that's not great um, for the most part, or they're just going to be um, dragging their feet on getting it done, getting it back to the person if somebody's asking for a letter of recommendation. Um, and then the other thing before we move on, I'm curious about these these reference letters and how old they can be. Like I remember looking at a letter of reference once and that came across my desk and it was eight years old, seven or eight years old. And I was kind of thinking, this is a long time. I mean, this, this has no, no temporal value. And I'm wondering yeah. if there's a rule for that or what, what you think. Yeah. I think it should be fresh off the job that you're coming from. Okay. For sure. Okay. Interesting. You know where else I think it could be helpful too, if there's someone that is going back to school for like a master's or a doctorate or something like that, and they're getting it from, um, you know, a department head, you know, maybe they took some time off from work. And, you know, I think that that, that holds weight as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this person stopped working, went to school to finish this X, Y, Z, and now they're entering the workforce again. I, I like them in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's wise. That's, mm -hmm. that's a smart way to go. Well, let's look at the next thing. And this is a little bit more controversial. I would say, especially right now in a general election where there are a lot of um, opinions. <laughs> okay. What is up with reviewing social media activity? Yeah. I mean, it? yeah. I mean, at this point, I think that we all should know the basics here around social media. Like basically anything that you post on the internet is public information. And yeah, we are going to search you. Um, we're going to do Google searches. We're going to look you up on LinkedIn. We're going to look at your Facebook. We're going to try to find you. So, you know, from that perspective, if you're in a job search, you should really tighten up those sources regardless of who you are or what you're posting, you know, specifically if you're in a job search. Um, I think that those those resources, those avenues of social media should always be tight, even if you are employed securely in a full-time job. I think that you should really limit who has access to what you're publicly posting online. Um, with that being said, politics, you just shouldn't be posting stuff about it because you have no idea who is looking at that and who is making the informed decision on your application to a position. Mm -hmm. So while we all sort of have our very strong opinions on what's going on this, with this general election, let's, let's tighten that up if we're in a job search, you know, just, just don't post about it. Just don't. So let me ask you. Against you. I'm sorry. Go it against you. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this a little bit further, because it seems to me that when I am conducting business, I'm using LinkedIn, you know, and I don't mm -hmm. want to engage in um, anything um, about a family, social or political. Right. I want it to be about the business community and, and what's going on and things of that nature. Um, to me, when I see somebody post something that I believe is is more on the political side, that's a huge turnoff for me. And I, I get like not appropriate. You know, I, I have a sense this is not yeah, appropriate. Yeah. Um, so is there ever a, a way or a time or a place that we look at LinkedIn as a separate animal? Or are you saying we should lump everything together? I think the same way you think about LinkedIn. I think it's weird when 
people post that someone passed away on their LinkedIn. You know, yeah. I think it's weird. I think it's alarming. And I, and now that I'm even saying this out loud to you, I'm wondering like, is there, do they have like an auto social media uh, post that like it's going to all their socials? Because yeah. I think that those things should be personal and they should be posted on your Facebook or Instagram or whatever else you're using. But if you are on LinkedIn, I don't think that we should be seeing that. Now on the flip side, in my opinion, you know, when you run a marathon for charity, that should be on LinkedIn. Yeah. You know, yeah. so so there is sort yeah. of that, like, let's yeah. pick and choose. Sometimes I don't think that people have that wherewithal to even have that thought. You know, I think sometimes it's so instant and we're so used to posting everything that we're just posting just to post because we like the likes and we like the gratification that we're getting and we're sharing with our community. Right. So mm -hmm. for me, yeah, I do think that LinkedIn specifically should be just about business or whatever we're engaging in or the community and stuff like that. I don't think that you should be posting anything political on on LinkedIn. Um, but you know, if we're jumping on top of that, if you are in a job search and you're still posting politically political driven stuff on a public Facebook page, mm -hmm. you can't assume that nobody is looking at that. So you really need to tighten. But even if your stuff is, you know, private, you have no idea. Someone could be screenshotting it. Someone could have a mutual connection. Mm -hmm. You know, you really have to just say, OK, I'm not going to post on social media during the job search, yeah. you know, tighten it up. Yeah, I love that you use the phrase tighten it up because it's it's not um, saying um, it's it's not advocating disengagement or filtering as much as mm -hmm. much as it's just saying for a period of time, let's be more thoughtful about it mm -hmm. and uh, and more intelligent. I should yeah. say you're you're going through a phase in your professional career, which should be looked at from your social aspect right yeah. so you need to put those two and two together during a period of time and just be like okay i'm going to step back from posting on social media mm -hmm. right do you um ever as a follow-up to this part of our conversation do you ever advise your teams your recruiters to tell the folks that you are looking at and just so you know, we are going to review your social media. Or do you feel like everybody just knows that this is going to happen? I think it's, it's common knowledge at this point. Yeah. It's a conversation that I have when people come to me and say, you know, I'm having trouble getting interviews or I'm having trouble getting mm -hmm. hired. It's like, OK, well, let's look at your social media. Is there um, something going on there? Is that why you're not getting interviews? Is that why you're not getting hired? You know, it's more of like a reflection thing. We're not mm -hmm. saying it. I mean, we... Facebook started in 2000 and what, five, six, like this has been around a long time at this point. I, I can't tell you what to do. You know, I, I think that we should just assume to tighten it up. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I think you're right. And yeah. I think that it's, um, it's it, to me. And, and again, this may sound like a super old lady thing to say, but I feel like it, it reflects your judgment. Sure. I love that. You know, if you, <laughs> I mean, and, you know, I always lived in my 30 years as a publisher, you know, I would write for myself and then I would write for my mother. Like, what would my mother think if my mother read this column mm -hmm. or this article in one of our newspapers? What would she say? Not like, oh, I love it. I mean, but it's like, you know, that was like the mom test. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and I kind of feel like this is one of those those times when you have to um, self curate or, you know, uh, take a deep breath or be more, you know, patient, whatever the words are, have more civility so yeah. that you're not just amping up um, a vision or a view of yourself that that might be temporal. And ultimately, you know, like I loved what you just said. If somebody that says I'm having trouble getting interviews, I think this is just like, wow. Mm -hmm. let's, yeah. let's look. Wow. Okay. Let's go on to the next thing about prior employment checks. How far do we go back? What do we look for? And I've got to ask this question. What about the time and the duration of how somebody's staying in a job? Yeah, sure. So obviously when you are filling out an application for a position, it will ask you, your, I think the last three positions that you worked. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Now, when we're talking about an employment check, you know, we're talking about a piece of a background check that's going to verification, that's going to verify the dates that you were paid mm -hmm. by employment, by employers, basically. So that's going to come up in a background check if you're running the employment piece of it. Okay. Um, that's verifying dates that you were earning income during the dates of the periods that you wrote down that you worked for okay. the purpose of uh, just an application process, you know, go back two or three jobs, you know, that's really all that matters. Um, and if HR is going to check that they are going to verify that you actually were employed with the start date and end date that you indicated, because a lot of times people might have a, a gap in their resume and they just add on that maybe they work someplace an extra six months or an extra nine months that led them into the next year. And if they're running an employment verification on that, they that will come up that, oh, no, this person actually ended in March of 23, not January of 24, you know? Yeah. So you really do need to be accurate and not embellish because someone could do a reference check on that or an employment verification that's run through the background. Okay. Interesting. Good, good advice. Because yeah, I can see where you're, you're also, you're just like, yeah, it was about that time versus really nailing it down and being yeah. specific. Yeah. Super interesting. Be honest about the, the month and the year for sure. Right. Let's move on to education and certification checks. So many people go out and get continuing education credits or they spend money, you know, pursuing advanced degrees on top of, you know, their their post secondary. What are your thoughts on this, and and how does this get checked? Yeah, so I have to be honest. I've never seen this happen. You know, okay. I've seen education verifications done through a background check be important. Mm -hmm. You know, did this okay. person actually graduate from X Y Z school in this year? Does this person actually have a master's? And was it completed in this year? But in terms of any like CEUs or continuing education, mm -hmm. no, I've never seen a verification. Okay. If that was ever um, something that was important or imperative to the job at hand, they would just accompany that with their application process in terms of like the certificate of completion. I've never okay. seen it be checked. Okay, interesting. But hang so, on to those certificates. Pardon me? Say that hang again? On hang on to those certificates because you do get certificates of completion with those programs, you know, hang on to them. You never know when you're going to need them. Yeah. Awesome. That's really good advice. Absolutely. I know that in LinkedIn, um, there's a place where you can store those, them. Yeah, you can. Yeah. And I think that it just seems to me, Katie, I mean, everybody and their brother, it seems like they're adding these certification pro programs. You know, you're just seeing more and more, and what do you mean? Do you mean that more and more people are attending them or more and more people are having these certifications and like they're becoming more of a thing? They're becoming more of a thing. So, you know, um, <laughs> uni yeah, universities are mm -hmm. offering them, uh, community colleges. I mean, even if, if you look at professional development that and this is not just in the nonprofit sector, but. Um, organizations that are like, if you will, trade groups or professional associations mm -hmm. are offering these types of training tracks. Um, and I think it's a good thing, but it, it's usually a pretty hefty investment. It's not, it's not free and it takes some time. It's usually there's scoring involved, testing involved, you know, things of that nature. And so um, I you think it's my, you see my face. I'm a little skeptical here because okay, yeah. you know, I've been seeing that a lot as well. And it's almost like there are these master classes that people are charging mm -hmm. for. And mm -hmm. it seems almost like a Ponzi scheme to me. <laughs> and, you know, like, what's the accreditation? Is there an accreditation? Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of like the Wild West at this point. Like anyone with yeah. a social media following can be like, hey, we're holding this this group, this study group, this focus group to concentrate on these skills over the next eight weeks, enroll. And it's like, wow, that sounds really fun and good. But, you know, who accredits that? Is it worth it? You know, I, and I'm not saying that all of them are one way or or vice versa. I'm just, I think that it's really new. I, I, I think that there's been a huge ramp up in those since COVID when everybody was home and taking those master class things. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, in fact, we have somebody coming on uh, later in the week to actually talk about 
certification projects and what it looks like and what we should be thinking about and how it impacts, you know, your, man, your career. Yeah. Are you going to get paid more money because you can <laughs> distribute, you can show you've achieved that or yeah. not? I mean, you attended an eight week training about, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how to deal with social skills in a workplace. Like, I, yeah. I don't know. I just don't, mm -hmm. I'm not buying in, you know? Okay. Interesting. Well, it's good to get your perspective because at the, at the end of the day, you are somebody that is making a lot of decisions for people in this employment environment. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's your leadership, you know, um, and your mindset, I'm thrilled to know more about it and to kind of get a feel for it because um, it's reality, right? It's the reality. Please, don't get me. I love professional development, but I like accredited professional development from a company that has been in the industry and has worked with, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And, yeah. you know, maybe they have some sort of specific programs, you know, that they discount for nonprofits or something like that. I'm on board. I love that. It keeps people engaged. It, it teaches them so many skills, especially in a world where a lot of people are working from home. Like it's really good to upskill that way. Um, but at the same time, the other sort of just random certifications that are happening on my Instagram feed willy nilly is, yeah, is what I'm being skeptical about. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I think it's yeah. an important thing to to uh, understand, especially since there's such a huge financial and time commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, really, really important. Well, let's get on to one of the biggest things, and that's like the process a background check, screening, checking records. Talk to us about what this looks like, how long it takes, mm -hmm. how expensive it can be. Like, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So background checks, you know, most companies like myself, we use a third party to outsource our background checks. I luckily found a company that allows me to do a la carte rather than paying, you know, a monthly subscription. They're great. Um, and you basically are just paying for the checks that you want. So the most common mm -hmm. is the national criminal, which is pretty standard for employment. And then I allow my clients to pick and choose what else they want. I work with a lot of schools. So obviously we're doing the, the, sex, um, the sex offender registry. That's also a national search. And then really anything else, you know, I've done CFO searches and bookkeeper searches um, that we had to run credit, you know, checks yeah. because it was imperative to the job function. If someone can't, you know, keep their finances in order, they probably shouldn't be in a financial capacity at a nonprofit. So it's totally up to the client. Um, the cost associated could vary. It really depends on how many checks you want to do. I would say standard for one person could be anything from 15 to $30, depending on the person. Wow. That's not, I thought it would be so much more. Mm -mm, no, just depends on the person, but I would say standard. We're looking about, I think like 27, but I've seen it go up to 45 and I've seen it below as low as 15 really depends on what registries we're checking. And how much should we um, plan in terms of time? Like how long does this take? Interesting you say that. So the company that I work with, I would say that their turnaround time is typically 48 hours. And that's even if I put something in on a Friday night, I will have it by Monday. So we're not talking about business days, which I do like it. Um, I've seen it take up to 72 hours. Uh, recently, just within the past two weeks, I had a client who has normally preferred to do their own background checks for HR purposes. They have their own vendor, et cetera, come to me and ask me to do a background on someone. And I'm like, well, I could do it, but you guys usually want to do it. What's happening? You know, why all of a sudden is there a change here? And she said that their current vendor is now so backed up that it's taking them three weeks to get responses. And this was a temp position and we needed to get the person in the door, right? They, they didn't have the three week wait time. So uh, it, whatever, long story short, we wound up doing the background and the person was able to start on that Tuesday when we ran a background on Friday. So, you know, I would say I don't know if there's something going on specifically with their vendor, but my experience in my career, I would say it doesn't take longer than 72 hours. Wow. But the reality is it, you, these are relationships with third party vendors that you've secured and you have. So sure. yeah. It's, yeah, it's not just like you're going to go out into the marketplace and get this done. Mm, yeah. And that is from the point that I am submitting the background check online. You also do have to get the uh, candidate to sign a release form before you do it. So mm -hmm. You got to get that back from them, have it uploaded into the portal, and then you can run the check. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Really good information. Um, this seems to me to be one of those, those 
sticking points. Um, is this just a standard pro forma that everybody should be doing, or is this more at a certain level? Or as you, as you said, you know, depending on what what that employee is going to be working with or mm -hmm. working in within an organization. What are your thoughts on this? I think all full time employees should be background checked. Okay. Wow. Okay. I didn't think you would say that. I think temps. I, I don't think that they need to be background checked, but I think it it just makes stand a good standard HR process to have all full-time employees on record background checked and have that in their employee file. Okay. Does that ever get uh, uh, reviewed or let's say somebody's with an organization, you know, for five years, does it get re -upped Background? Or? No. Yeah. It's just like, no. a one, it's no. like yeah. when you come in. I think you can you cover your butt that way in a lot of aspects because God forbid something does happen. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, no, we should have caught that. That would have come up on a background. Yeah. Interesting. OK. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you find with your candidates and the folks that you work with that something comes up and somebody's surprised? I've had two people be surprised. For the most part, I've had anyone that has some sort of issue be transparent prior prior mm -hmm. to it being run. So it was never a surprise. And we've always been candid about it to our client. Um, something so silly and it was such a long time ago, but someone was, uh, urinating in public on the Jersey shore and it came up on the background. They didn't know that it was on the background because they didn't get, um, what, a, a, like they were arrested, but they weren't held, like they weren't charged, yeah. but the arrest came up and they were like, what? Like, you know, it was really funny and it was kind of innocent, but not, but at the same time, like, <laughs> I just took the person anyway, but they were, they were like so embarrassed. So it doesn't come up often that someone is surprised. Yeah. Well, two out of a lot of folks. Yeah. That you dealt with. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, Katie, that's amazing. Well, but I think it's really, it's really an interesting um, thought that you need to know, right? I mean, you need to be thoughtful about what this is going to look like, just like we started the conversation with your social media. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you you do need yeah, you to, to be honest. Is if you're in a job search and something was going on, you have to be honest with you know the HR person or, in my case, the the staffing firm with your recruiter. Tell them you know any sort of backstory you have. I love it. Well, Katie Warnick, you are like my go-to person. All things you know, HR, labor, staffing. I always, uh, I always learn something new from you, but I always get a good perspective and mindset. Um, that kind of is more holistic. It's not just on that staffing side. Um, and, and so I appreciate you sharing that with us. You know, this is the time of year. So many nonprofits go back out into the marketplace and look for that temp labor, you know, yeah. things ramp up. I mean, so these are important conversations. And so I yeah. really, you know, yeah, we, we've been busy. We're running into, you know, full event season for sure. And then, you know, right after that is a lot of that database cleanup because everyone needs to get their donations in before year end, you know, to get those acknowledgement letters out. So, you know, this is really heavy temp season for us. So, you know, if you are feeling backed up, if your director of development is doing, you know, data entry into a razor's edge or whatever, you know, if it's not a good uh, use of their time, you should hire a temp. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. And I think that's something we we don't think about um, until it's like way too late or we've burnt out our staff, which is yeah. even more perilous. Yeah. The director of development is stuffing envelopes to do an invite for their fall gala. It's not a good use of their time. Yeah. Hire them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, they have, they have bigger fish to fry. Fish to fry. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Katie Warnick, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique, check out staffingboutique.org. You can learn more about Katie and her team, um, the process that they go through, where they work and how they work. It's really interesting because I think that it's something that if you understand the process and once you get involved, um, then it, it becomes part of your 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 operations, right? But if you don't understand it, it can be a little overwhelming to even start planning that way um, until, frankly, you're in a crisis or you're just and I, and I always say that it's like, you know, I do sales calls. We don't use staffing firms. We don't use staffing firms. We're a nonprofit. We don't have money. And then like someone quits and then it's crisis mode and then they need me, you know, which is fine. I love that. I love that story because I'm so used to it. 
Um, but once you start working with a staffing firm and you have a good relationship with the recruiter or your, you know, your client rep, you know, it almost mm -hmm. becomes like, how did I work without this? You know, we literally right. can get you staff within 24 hours sometimes. So, right. um, you know, and, and you trust our screening process. You know, in the beginning, we always say, we'll send you resumes, you can interview the person. But once you trust our process, you know, it's like, just send me someone, you know, right. it's very right. easy and seamless. Well, it's, it's an interesting thing too, Katie, because for so many people, it's a whole mindset shift. And then mm -hmm. when, like you said, once you get into it, then you're just like, okay, yeah, go. Yeah. Um, and you solve a lot of problems. So this has been great. Uh, check out staffingboutique.org. You can learn more about Katie, like I said, and her team mm -hmm. and how they do things. It's, it's a really an interesting conversation. You know, another really interesting conversation we have daily is provided to us because we have these amazing presenting sponsors and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader fundraisers friday and your part-time controller okay my friend thank you thank you thank you Always for a pleasure. good to see you have an amazing week you too thanks everyone